control. God, I'll have you keep going. Welcome, everyone. Just when we thought winter was over, reminded that we live in Cache Valley. I talked to a, a, a former board member, Brian, I know well, this morning, and he was returning my call from yesterday. I said, where are you calling from? He said, I'm in Barbados. And I wanted to hang up right then and there. It's not right. So Brian, thanks. Um, you know, I think one of the things, so Hadley's great uh, intro, one of the things that um, I find uh, about your work life that maybe a lot of people don't know is that you're a serial commuter and have been for a while. So we were just talking, so I think, so Brian works out of the Manhattan office and the Salt Lake office. Right. So what, what's that uh, back and forth like right now? Um, so, and we'll probably get into this a little bit. When I started at Goldman in 93, it actually started out as a two-year position. And 19 years later, I was still working at Goldman. And that's when uh, my wife, who's also from Cache Valley and went to school here, our family is from here, this is where we grew up. I love biking, I love skiing, both of those are hard to do in New York City. And that's when I approached Goldman and negotiated with them to see if I could still run my management team, but split my time between, run my management team in New York, but split my time between uh, uh, the New York and the Salt Lake City office. So I probably spend oh, maybe about a third of my time in New York, maybe 40% of my time in uh, the Salt Lake office, and then the other 25% uh, of my time, I'll say other, meaning, you know, in the last six weeks, whether it's a day in Boston or Washington, D.C. or Florida, just traveling uh, with different client meetings. Yeah, yeah. So let's start back. You said you grew up in, uh, in Cache Valley. Yeah. Um, tell me about your childhood, um, what, and, and we'll get into this a little later, but and what was your first job? So moved to Cache Valley in the late, this is going to age me, late 70s. Um, I was uh, nine years old. I uh, moved to North Logan and started North Park Elementary School. I went there to North Cache, which by the way, my grandmother went to, probably in the early 1900s. <laughs> um, still there. Uh, yeah, still there. Um, so although we moved here in, uh, when I was nine years old, my parents grew up here, grandparents, so many generations of uh, people in Cache Valley, um, and then on to Skyview High and then Utah State. Um, my first jobs, um, I had about every miserable job you could think of as a you know, teenager growing up. Um, my first one, I don't even know the name of it now, it used to be Pete's Donut where I would literally, it's right on Main Street, I spent most of my time in the back peeling potatoes. Um, from there, I was able to leverage that into a job into Burger King. Um, from there, I worked at, uh, from Jack's Food Town, I mowed lawns at the hospital, I worked construction for a summer, um, and all these jobs were actually were very helpful for me growing up. Um, one of the probably scariest conversations I had was my third or fourth month at Burger King, dressed up in the orange plaid head to toe, and the manager pulled me aside and said, let's grab, uh, let's grab lunch. So we went on our break, sat down with our Whopper with cheese, and uh, he, he said yeah, he was about 30 years old. He had the earrings, the ponytail, hair down to his waist, and he told me, he goes, Brian, he said, I've been watching you. I've got my eye on you. He goes, I think there's big things for you at Burger King. He said, I started this job when I was 16. By the time I was 17, quit high school and focused straight on the you know, Burger King uh, so I could rise the corporate ladder. He said, here I am, 30 years old and managing the Logan store. And he goes, I think you have a similar path. <laughs> at that point, I quit a couple months later and really decided I need to focus on school. Um, the other lesson I learned is uh, when I did construction for a summer, it was a complete disaster. And I realized I should be probably the last person in Utah that should ever be holding a nail gun. And once again, I learned that I should really focus on school. Perfect. That's exactly what we want to tell what you tell us. <laughs> so stay in school. Same. There you go. 
So Skyview High School, there's quite a Skyview Mafia around the time that you uh, you went there. What, 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 it's just something in the water, right? There's you, there's, there's several of you and all ended up in finance, right? Yeah, yeah, there was a pretty big group. I think it was more random than anything. Yeah. Um, some of the guys that I ran around with, uh, kind of a mystery what they're doing now. Probably didn't take the great, you know, the path that uh, would be the most normal. One of them wanted to, uh, you know, basically just snowboard his life, so he fishes in Alaska in the summer so he can snowboard 150 days out of the year. So we had a couple extremes. I had some others, uh, I don't know, I talked to Blake, I don't know if Blake's here. Uh, there he is. Blake, uh, we ran around together in high school and I can't say too much about him because I think he teaches and represents here, but I think his junior year in high school, winter quarter, he had more ski days than he actually uh, went to school. Um, but uh, <laughs> he's never gonna be here because he'll say he's in school. Um, but anyways, there were a handful of us that continued on to uh, finance. Yeah, so and, and where and when did you meet Natalie? So that's a, uh, oh, that's kind of an interesting story. I'll briefly tell it. Um, after my, our dad's sitting in here. So uh, I'll be careful. <laughs> um, after my mission, um, it, I, I, got a, I got a strange call. It was someone that I wasn't a close friend, never really did anything with him in the past. But he, uh, called up and he said, Brian, he goes, I've got a date for tomorrow. I'm nervous. Can you find a date? And I said, oh, it's short notice, but let me make some calls. And so I uh, you know, called some people. I was able to line up a date and went out. And his date was Natalie, who I later married. Um, but uh, we, went, we went on a hike. We went on Crimson Trail, went for a hike. And by the end of the date, it seemed like my date was kind of walking ahead. He was walking a little behind, and Natalie and I were walking together and doing a lot of the talking. And I actually called her a week later and said, no, Natalie, it's Brian Broadbent. We met a week ago. And I said, I just have a couple questions for you. I said, number one, I said, there's a song that was popular a few years ago. Rick Springfield sings it. It's called Jesse's Girl. And I said, it's about a uh, guy that has a friend that's dating this girl that he really likes, and he doesn't know what to do. I said, are you familiar with that song? She goes, yeah, yeah, I've heard it. And I said, great. Uh, do you want to go out with me? And she, I was fortunate enough, she said yes, and we started dating, and so that's how I met her. But I just want to say, it was not a close friend that I did that to. It was an acquaintance. <laughs> It was a guy who skis half the time. Yeah, it, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't Blake. It wasn't Blake. So what what stands out from your experience at Utah State? Um, <clears throat> you know, Utah State. I grew up here. Grew up uh, going to the Aggie games, basketball games, football games. Uh, my parents went here. My aunts and uncles went here. My grandparents went here. So it wasn't when I grew up. It was just kind of what you did. Um, I, didn't, I didn't actually apply to other schools. I just, you know, you grow up, you go to Utah State. And so it was, a, uh, it was absolutely a, it was a great experience. Um, great people, great professors. Um, it 100% prepared me for a, a career in finance. The classes were um, specifically the uh, finance classes and some of the professors uh, were, you know, a couple of them in particular, great influence. And uh, I think of it now and how it's changed over the last decade um, versus then. And it, it's, uh, you know, still being involved in it, it's, uh, it's that much better. But it's, uh, you know, great, uh, great college and does a great job preparing students for a career in finance or other opportunities. So you graduated in 93. Logan to Goldman. Pretty simple like that, right? I mean, it just happens. One day you're here, next day you're in Manhattan, living large. Kind of. Um, believe it or not, some, I, I remember something about tombstones. Yeah, that's, 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 that's going to age both of us because I don't think either of those are used anymore. That's right. Um, or tombstone means something different now. That's right. But, uh, um, so, believe it or not, Goldman's not the epicenter of finance for global finance, and so there weren't a lot of Wall Street firms, actually there weren't any Wall Street firms that would uh, visit, uh, visit Utah State at that time. 
Um, but it was something finance, I didn't know a lot about it, but business interested me. And so, uh, you know, the movie Wall Street came out. I watched that a dozen times. I thought that seemed really cool. Um, and so it's something that I wanted to do, but there wasn't a, a great connection between Utah State and, uh, and uh, Wall Street. So at the time, I get the Wall Street Journal every day, and in the back pages of the Wall Street Journal, there would be tombs what they called tombstones. But if a company went public, if, a, if there was a business transaction, they would list all of the banks involved. And so I sat down, this was the uh, fall quarter of my senior year, um, sat down and put together a spreadsheet of all the investment banks I could find. And it came down to about 50 banks, uh, mostly in New York, but throughout the country, some in LA, San Fran, Chicago, but the bulk of them in New York. And I called them, uh, I cold called them. I, I, again, not to ages, there actually was not an internet back in 92, 93 where you could do this. So I call information and I remember you would get uh, two, I think information cost 50 cents and you get two numbers. So I call information, get two phone numbers, write them down, call them again. And then I would cold call all of uh, the 50 firms, introduce myself, send out the resumes and uh, sent out uh, literally about 50 resumes um, all over the country, but primarily in New York. About three or four weeks later, two or three weeks later, the letters started coming back to me and nothing bruises an ego worse than getting rejection letter after rejection letter after rejection letter. And they all said the same thing. Brian, thank you so much for applying. Um, you, you know, you have great qualifications, you look smart, probably handsome, but you're not going to be, you know, we don't have a spot for you, please uh, consider us down the road. And so literally, I got 49 rejection letters. Um, one firm, Solomon Brothers, said they would come and uh, interview. And they, they came to Utah, they chose three or four students from each of the major colleges. I think there were 12 of us. So three or four from BYU, U of U, a couple from Weber, then USU. And they said they're gonna be there in 10 days and I got one of the interview spots. So at that time, my life, more or less, more or less I put on hold. And I spent, besides going to school and working, I spent every waking minute, every spare minute, preparing for the interview. I read books on market song and brothers. I read books on interviewing. I had books on the you know, 20 most difficult interview questions and what they're looking for. And I would review this. And then at night, I, we had recently been married. Uh, not that my wife was uh, you know, thrilled with this, but at night I actually would role play where she would ha ask me the interview questions and I would practice answering. And it got to the point where not only I practice how I wanted to answer and the story that I wanted to tell, but I, you know, am I going to pause after this? Am I going to lean forward and look at him? Am I, I went through everything. And as I was going through this, we'd have Sunday dinners at my parents' house, and I was telling my mom about this process, and the interview was a couple days away. And what I was doing, she said, why are you, you know, she goes, this seems a little extreme, doesn't it? And I actually told her, I said, I said this is actually, at the age of 23, the most important interview of my life. And she looked at me and started laughing. She goes, Brian, you're so dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, it really is. I said, because if I can get a shot, I said, all I want is a shot to get into the game. I go, once I can get into the game, then you know, hopefully I can prove myself. I just want that one shot. Um, the interview went well. Um, they flew me back to, Solomon Brothers flew me back to New York. And at that point, I called up all 49 firms that had rejected me. And I said, you know, I'm coming back to interview for a final round of interviews at Solomon Brothers. As long as I'm there, I'd love an opportunity to interview with your firm. And actually, I was able to line up three more interviews off that. And so I flew back with four interviews. One of them was Goldman. Um, and uh, uh, interviews went well. Uh, Goldman gave me an offer basically on my trip, I more or less uh, accepted on the spot. And that was the, uh, 
uh, to your position at Goldman. And, and then my wife, who graduated from USU in education, did a similar thing. She went, you know, we went and got a phone book and information on all the private schools in New York City. And uh, she cold called them and flew out and was able to line up an interview on one. She was able to line up a few after that. And then also got a job. And she got a job at a private school on the Upper East Side that she actually had a rejection letter from, but I never told her I got a rejection letter. And so actually at my office, at my home, we have two framed rejection letters sitting there, one from Goldman and one from the Buckley School. Um, so that's how we got there. Thank you for sharing that. That's a, it's an amazing story of grit and resilience. I think that's instructive for, for everyone here. So now you're at Goldman. Um, what, what did you do in your first few months or years that made you stand out? Um, so at Goldman, the interview process, it's long. A lot of people apply. And you get a lot of very well qualified people there. Um, so I'm not sure how I made it there. <laughs> but I got there and I said, you know what, I can't control that I'm not from the, uh, you know, the Harvards or the Stanfords or the Yales or Princetons, which is most of the class, my training class in New York. And I go, there might be people that are you know, smarter than me, which certainly there are. Um, but the one thing I could control was uh, work ethic and job performance. So I went in there and said, I want to be in the department in the area that I'm working in. I want to be the and known as the hardest person working at Goldman Sachs, which is kind of a lofty expression to say because there's a lot of people that probably have similar goals that work long hours. Um, and so number one, I want to just demonstrate to them, I, again, this was my one shot. Um, and so uh, worked, it, it wasn't, put it so it wasn't a nine to five job. Yeah. Um, and so worked a lot of hours. But it's not just about working hard. I tried to work smart. Um, I'd say one thing that I did uh, is I tried to take ownership. Now I'll have different financial analysts work for my team. And a lot of them will come in. And a lot of them will work hard and they're smart. But they kind of, I'll, I'll say they, they punch the clock, so to speak, or will parrot the information. They'll do what you ask. But maybe there's not a lot of thought into it. As, and, and some that I've hired and worked with are just A+. Plus. But what I tried to do, I think, really what set a difference. I tried to take ownership. Um, when I was given a project to do, not only would I do it, but I'd think, OK, why are they asking me to do this? What can I learn from this? Uh, there's a very steep learning curve, um, you know, starting at Wall Street, from, certainly from uh, Cash Valley. But I wanted to keep it steep throughout the whole time. And then not only do the job, but put myself in their shoes. OK, so if they're asking me to do this, what, what actually are they looking for? And I would come back to them, not day one, but after many months, I'd say, you know, this is one way to think about it. But would you think about showing the information maybe like this or presenting it that way or working like this? And I'll tell you, four out of five times, they'd probably say no. But maybe one out of five, they'd say, you know what, that's probably, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Maybe we'll try that. But I think it showed that it was ownership, that I liked the job, passion for the job. And uh, like I said, it was, a, it was just a two-year position. Then you typically go back to business school, and then you would get hired on it full time, which was my path I was going to do or take. I applied to business school, got accepted in the school that I wanted to get into. And then at the same time, Goldman asked me to uh, stay on an interview for associate position. And uh, I, I love the job. They, you know, so even if I went to business school, I was going to come back and apply for this position. So I interviewed at Goldman. Um, the interview went well. They gave me an offer. So at that point, I said uh, no to business school, yes to Goldman, and uh, uh, stayed on. There was a six-month training program. And then after the six-month training program, there were, there were 60 of us in my training class throughout the globe. Most of them, probably 57 of them, had a business degree or a law degree. And then there were three of us that I don't know how they let us in, but who didn't. Um, but then after that, you have usually a couple years in the area that I work in, which is private wealth management, to establish a business and become a self-sustaining business. And when you get out of the training program, it's almost like there's this stopwatch that goes off and it starts clicking, um, ticking away. And it, it's tough. There's a lot of pressure. There's a, uh, usually about one out of three or one out of four make it. So it's probably about a 70% failure rate. Um, and that's usually in the first couple of years. And so 
I'd, I'd been working long hours, but I, yeah, Natalie was aware of this. I said, you know what, you got to give me a couple more years here. And if you can't tell already, sometimes I do things a little extreme or maybe I'm a little anal or OCD, whatever you want to call it. But I told Natalie, I said, you know what, this was in Jan 1, 1996. I said, I'm not going to take a day off until I become a self-sustaining business. And so I work basically seven days a week every, so I, I, it was usually about 80 to 90 hours a week, or I'd work 12 to 14 hours a day, Monday through Friday, maybe an eight hour day on Saturday. Seventh day is the day of rest, so I'd only clock in a five or six hour day, and then I'd uh, start over. And so anyways, I, not only did you, you know, you had to be really focused, but after a year, um, I was able to have a self-sustaining business, and you know, 25 years later, here I am. It's an amazing story. So, $12 billion in client assets. What's the median account for you about? So we work with a hundred or so, maybe a little more, a hundred or so family groups throughout the U.S. Um, so you're going to do the math really quick, right? Uh, so if you say 12 billion divided by a hundred or so, maybe it's about 120 million per family. But, so this is for the stats people, right? You guys know the difference, mean, median, and mode? Actually, it was one of the few people that enjoyed stats. Um, but, so our mean would be about, you know, 100 million, 120 million. But the uh, median, or the most uh, common occurrence, would probably be about a $40 million account, um, is what we work with. Obviously, you have, we have a few larger accounts that can skew the average up, where we work with uh, several clients, uh, or one client in particular, we manage uh, about $800 million for him. Um, we work with several clients in the $200, $300, $400 million range, but the median would probably be closer to about $40 million a, uh, $40 million a client. And how big is your team? So our team, we have, uh, we have a 12-person, uh, I think we just added a couple, actually it's a 14-person team. There's myself and my business partner. We've been working together Basically, actually, we just hit 20 years now. I don't know what you do for a 20-year anniversary. Is that silver? I don't know. Sure. Anyways, um, but uh, today, Mike, <laughs> there you go. And it's a great fit. He's actually we've worked together 20 years. If people meet us, we are the exact opposite. He is from the East Coast that went to Ivy League schools, Jewish, you know, very typical uh, New Yorker. I am, you know, someone that, you know, grew up in Cache Valley, uh, Utah State, Mormon. Uh, I love the outdoors. He hates the cold. I like to bike. He doesn't like to really, you know, I mean, we're just saying we have different vacations. But it's we're very different people, but we've made it work. And I think we're so extreme opposites. He's more of a, you know, a, a smoother, you know, talk, smooth talker. I'm probably more quiet guy, the numbers guy, but it works really, it's worked really well for us. So there's two of us. We have five what are called financial analysts, investment professionals, and then another six what are called wealth management professionals on our direct team that work with the clients. And then obviously all of, uh, all of Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, different areas supporting us. How do you find these uh, high net worth individuals? How did you build your business? So unfortunately, they don't come to you. And this is where I, where I got the long-term job. I went to the six-month training program, and that's where they literally, they, you know, they go through a training program, and they give you a, uh, you know, basically a computer, a desk, and chair, and say, okay, go build your business. Um, so you can build it any way you want. If you think of high net worth people in America, or in the world for that matter, most of them, most of them, if you looked at the Forbes 400, for example, started, how do you be on that kind of net worth, it's through uh, you know, having a private company and either taking it public or selling it. So if you look at the wealthiest people in the world, you know, whether it's uh, you know, Warren Buffett or Gates or Z Zuckerberg, you know, they all have one thing in common. They started a company and, and took it public or sold it. Um, there's also old money. There's uh, athletes that have a lot of money, uh, actors. We work with um, some, not a lot of names, some names we've worked with athletes in the past, we've worked with uh, entertainers at, um, in the past, but they're terrible clients, just terrible clients. They, 
they have an entourage you have to please, they have agents that are always, it's just, it's, so, you know, it's a small part of our business. There's, uh, uh, you know, there's old money, which I don't relate well with at all. Um, uh, my partner is better with them. Um, really how I built my business is uh, working with individuals that have started private companies and they've either sold it or they've taken it public. Um, just for an example, in, uh, so I got out of the training program in 96, and so hopefully it's not about just working hard, but it's about working smart. Um, in 1996, Bill Clinton signed a telecommunications act that actually made it legal for radio stations to own more than two radio stations in, uh, in a city. Before 1996, you could not. Goldman had a research report on this. We talked about that. There was going to be huge consolidation in the radio industry. And so I knew about this. I literally, the first several months, I cold called every private radio station company, you know, in the tri-state area throughout the U.S. and research um, because at that point they had a lot of net worth, but it was all illiquid. But when the consolidation boom happened, they had a uh, liquidity event overnight. And so in 96, 97, there was a huge consolidation. And so, so basically, most of my business are from individuals that have sold a company, have taken it public. And really, I focused on what I called at the time change of circumstance. I wanted to look at individuals that were forced to make a decision. And uh, hopefully we'd be a part of that. And the more complicated it was, the better. Meaning if it was stock, restricted stock, uh, uh, you know, different legal restrictions, I thought hopefully I could work harder than let other people competing for it and show them that we had some sort of uh, expertise in there. What's the hardest part of your job? Is it finding clients? So yes and no, meaning the first several years of my, uh, you know, starting this, absolutely. That's what you. That's what I lay, you know, lay, uh, you know, lay awake at night and think about. You know, how am I going to find this client? How's this going to work? Um, hardest part of my job now is actually, it's the it's managing money, and the worst part is you know losing money for clients. Meaning markets don't always go up, unfortunately. Or this would be the best job in the world. Um, this job you can never be right. Meaning if the markets go up a lot, you kick yourself because hindsight's twenty twenty. You kick yourself, say, why didn't I buy more of this, or why didn't I do this? You look back, it was so obvious at the time. If investments go down, you look back and say, ah, that, I should have seen that coming. Why did I ever put any money there? So it's actually, it's an interesting job where a lot of times you're not really happy in an up market or a down market because you're always second guessing everything that you do. But the hardest part, by far the hardest part, is uh, uh, manage money when you have market downturns. Um, that's where I'll, uh, you know, sometimes lose sleep at night. Not normal volatility if the market's down five or ten percent, but when you have major corrections, whether it's through the internet bubble or through the financial crisis, um, where you know you sit down in front of clients and say, your portfolio was fifty million, the markets have gone down, now it's worth thirty-seven. You know, but what's ten million between friends? Um, that's sometimes harder to, you know, have them think of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So I just have one, one more question. We want to get uh, our students to ask uh, some questions. Something we talked about a while ago. But So you're a finance guy. Um, are communication skills of any importance at all in your uh, line of work or writing skills? So what I do is the answer is absolutely yes. But I'm in the, uh, <clears throat> what I would call front line, so to speak, meaning not, you know, Goldman employs 34,000 people. A lot of the employees, actually the majority of them, actually are not speaking to clients on a day-to-day -day regular basis. Um, many of them are, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, quant numbers. Many of them uh, are, you know, you, you, like writing skills. So I'm a terrible. I would be terrible at that. I'm a terrible writer. Um, but if you're a good writer, many work on a research department. But that's what they do. They spend their time writing research reports. Um, but what, what I do, the, it's, it, the communication skills, it's, you know, I, I'm speaking to clients every day, um, all day long, so it's important. And, and you can have the smartest people in the world, but if, if you're talking to clients and working with them, if you don't have the communication skills, 
it's not, it's, you know, you're not going to do very well. But you don't have to have the communication skills to do well at Goldman because so, you can work in investment banking where it's more spreadsheet analysis. You can, be, you can work on the trading floor where it's just straight numbers. You're not communi communicating with anyone but uh, you know, just trading stocks. So, so there's so many different avenues you can uh, go in. Um, so you really just really try to focus on your strengths. That's great. Awesome. So we have time for a few questions. If you just want to raise your hand, state your name and your major before you ask your question, that'd be great. But Kyle and I both have microphones. So raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, my name's Landon Haycock. I'm an MBA student. You talk about uh, working hard and working smart. Like, what kind of things do you do to work smart when you talk about working 80 and 90 hour weeks? What are you also doing that we could do that's smart? Yeah, I, I wanted to. So again, I, I, there's a lot of people in a lot of different areas. Um, uh, but Goldman included that I'll see a lot of people that they'll put in all these hours and time but their business isn't growing or they're not getting success. And you kind of need to take a step back and say, okay, what's, what are you missing there? Um, I always tried to get leverage in everything that I'm doing. So instead of just finding, you know, I, you know so my first number of years in this job, instead of like cold calling rich people, I tried to be a little more specific in that. I mentioned the uh, radio broadcasters, for example. After that, I went on to, uh, there was consolidation in the financial area. So I tried to get up to speed in one area where I'd spend a lot of time trying to become, hopefully, an expert in that area and then leverage it and then just go out. Um, I try to, I work with 100 different family groups. Um, everyone's asset allocation is different, meaning some are more aggressive, some are more conservative. But the investment choices you make don't have to be different. Meaning, if I like this strategy or idea for you know, client number one, it could work for client number 10 and 50, where I can really get up to speed and comfortable with it. Um, but the sizing could be different. Maybe it makes 5% here versus 15% there. But everything you want to do, you want to be scalable in your business. And that's what I try to do, leverage and scalable in my business. Um, I look at other teams at Goldman that have had a hard time growing, and uh, um, you know they they're using different investments. They're going different directions, and they're just you know kind of just running on this uh, you know treadmill and not going anywhere. But I think if you can really look to use leverage, clients will come to us. Every client that I go to in a meeting, they'll say, you know what, I like what you're showing in presentation, but I'd really like to see it this way. I'd really like to see it that way. There's a lot of people in my business that will customize everything. Um, I don't know, in, in my business, this was business management class. It was, uh, I think it was business management or business marketing. They, I, I, one of my favorite quotes that I learned when I was at Utah State, right, Utah State plug, um, was the Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford, in the 1920s. He said, you can have any color of car you want, as long as it's black. I try to manage the business the same way. So when clients ask this, I say, yeah, absolutely, you can see it that way. But I'm going to show you we can actually do it a little bit better. And I'll try to educate them where I will train my clients versus having my clients train me. So everything I try to do, it's, it's how do I get leverage from this and scalable. It's the opposite of Burger King, where what was the motto in the 70s? You can have it your way. It's Burger King. See, another lesson I learned from Burger King. We got to get them recruiting here. <laughs> Hi, Brian. My name is Andrew. I'm a senior studying accounting. Are those are all the questions. Is that right? We're good. Um, and I just want to say thanks for coming out today. This has been great. My question is, um, would you run us through kind of what happened or what, what your job looked like in 08? Um, you said it, it's obviously really hard when, when there are downturns in the market, and that's obviously a huge time. I just think that'd be really interesting to, to hear about that. So all of us are familiar with AD or BC. In the financial world, AD or BC was Monday morning, September 15th. And instead of AD, BC, it was before Lehman or after Lehman, um, which was Monday morning, September 15th, 2008. Um, when they went bankrupt, that changed the world. It changed the finance industry. Um, markets, it was the worst correction 
that the market had had since uh, the Great Depression, 1929. Uh, from top to bottom, the stock market was down about 58%. US stock market, international markets were down closer to 70. Um, and it was a really bad day, really bad time, really bad year. Um, and it was, it was just hard. Um, you, you know, there were a lot of moving pieces. Um, it was a tricky time for the government. It could have ended a lot worse. There were a lot of other financial firms on the brink of going under. I think the government, uh, you, know, this, you could argue this one way or the other, I think they did an unbelievably good job of providing liquidity for the markets. Um, they went, I, I remember the meeting, uh, I wasn't at the meeting, but uh, they, they gathered the 10 biggest banks together excuse me, eight biggest banks together. There used to be 10, and then Bear Stearns and Lumen went out, but um, eight biggest banks together. And they basically brought into Washington and said, uh, you are going to take this money from the government whether you want it or not. Now, Goldman didn't want the money. We didn't, at the time, we didn't think we needed it. But what they didn't want, what the government did, because it was very expensive to take it, we had to pay it back, interest rates. And by the way, Goldman, we did pay back all the government money. Um, there were some issues in that a few years later coming up in the press. Um, but uh, what the government did, they didn't want there to be the haves and the have-nots saying, would you like money to help? Would you like? So they just forced you to take it. And so they did a lot of, uh, they did a lot of things at the time when liquidity was basically non-existent. You, the the bid-ask and certain investment products got blown out. And it was, a, it was a really tough three months, I think, versus what happened versus what could have happened. I think we came out of it uh, very well. And there were, you know, it was a very, very tough uh, uh, six months in the uh, market from uh, September 15th until the market bottomed out at uh, S&P bottomed out at 666, March 9th, 2009. I'm not sure if there's any meaning to that or not, but uh, that was the uh, bottom point on uh, March 9th. Um, so, but it, it, was, it was very hard, challenging, working crazy hours and, uh, uh, you, you know, a, a lot of uh, trying to keep up on everything and trying to keep clients from just an outright panic and free-for-all. Hi, my name is uh, Jordan. I'm a finance major. Um, one question that I have is, as a 25-year-old, like dealing with obviously very successful clients and trying to build your business around very successful clients, how did you appear credible to them? Or what was some things you did to appear credible to them? So it was actually really hard. Um, so I started at Goldman. I uh, did a two-year LDS mission. Started at Goldman when I was 24. I worked on a team for two years, 26. I got out of a training program. I was uh, you know, basically 27. At the time, the, the problem, when I was 27, I probably looked 18. Um, my father had this problem. He uh, was a surgeon. And how he overcame that as a younger looking person at the age, he actually grew a mustache. But that was in the 70s when there was Tom Selleck and Burt Reynolds, and I didn't feel like growing a mustache <laughs> to hopefully make me look older or more mature. And so there wasn't a lot. I just looked young. And so not only was I young, but what just really hurt me, I just looked young. Um, um, what I did to try to overcome that is I tried to, again, I mentioned this, when I would go in and meet with individuals, I was OK if there was a complicated situation. And I actually wanted it more complicated. Because it was almost when I got, an interview, when I got the interview at Solomon Brothers, when I would get, believe it or not, you know, people were 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million necessarily don't want to meet with you every day. So when I would ever land one of those meetings, I would basically really prep for it. So I would go in there. I think probably more prepared than a lot of the other uh, firms that I was competing with, where I could hopefully show them. It wasn't going to be with necessarily uh, you know, my wisdom of the markets, but hopefully my uh, knowledge of their situation, different ideas, how I could tie the two together, and really come up with creative solutions that maybe other firms were looking as this kind of uh, you know, okay, another person I'm going to sit down with and, and maybe not put the prep time into it, is where I really tried to show them that I was prepared, knowledgeable, and uh, more than capable for managing their uh, financial situation. 
All right, and we have time for one last question. Tell what did you? Uh, hi, my name is Elijah Toa. I'm an accounting major as well. I just had a question. You talked about a learning curve, and for you it was more like a learning mountain. Um, what do you feel like we as students can do now to prepare for that curve, or maybe give us some examples of what you did in that situation to really adapt to that um, curve? Okay. So a couple of things. When I'm looking, when I'm looking to hire at Goldman uh, for my team or other individuals, and I think I could probably say for Goldman, but for, specifically for myself when we interview for our team, three main criteria. It's not going to be rocket science, right? You've got to be, you've got to be smart, hardworking, and honest. So those are three just, but you know, every, so smart's pretty, you know, you look at the GPA, you know, pretty straightforward. You can still, tell in a conversation, yes, are they involved in the markets and so forth. Uh, hardworking, you know, it's not going to surprise you that again, if you work on Wall Street, it's not going to be a nine to five job. So, you, you know, you have to make that very clear. And then honest, you're working with millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. You, you have to, I, I mentioned earlier, ownership. Um, you have to take ownership. If there's a mistake or an error, I have not, with different people on my team, mistakes happen. Stuff happens, right? Um, I, that's okay. Where I have been very upset is if you, you, you immediately, if there's a mistake or an error, you have to raise your hand. You have to, I have to get, you get me involved immediately where we can correct it and figure out what we need to do. But right, most people get hurt on the cover up, right? You know, Martha Stewart spent time in jail not for the actual uh, crime, but for the cover-up of the crime. But if you look at, you know, there's a history of this. And so you have to have those three things. Now, in addition to that, th those are minimum qualifications. In addition to that, and this is going to sound a little corny, but I mean it, you, you do have to be a team player. You do have to be able to work well with others. Um, as sick as this sounds, the people that I spend time with on my desk I spend more time with them than I do with my wife and three daughters. So if that's going to be the case, you, you want someone that you, you, know, you know they're going to have your back. You know they're going to be you know, someone that you can count on and work on. The, the one thing I'd say specifically for Utah State, I think Utah State does an unbelievably good job on the uh, curriculum and the knowledge of uh, the finance. Like I came out of Utah State and going through the training programs. I felt as comfortable as any one of my training class as far as crunching numbers, working through the time value of money, finance, where, and, and Utah State's done a much better job in this over the last few years, where Utah State would fall short a little bit is not in the book knowledge, but in the actual knowledge of, of what's, you know, what's going on in the general world. What, if, this news, what, if, if this is going on in the world, what does that mean? What do the politics mean? How does this interact? And so what I would say is, uh, uh, and professors have heard me say this in the past, is not just the book knowledge, but also kind of the street smarts about interest rates. And what does it mean if the Fed's doing? What does it mean with the 10-year Treasury going up? And what does it mean with this new budget plan and interest rates? And how is that going to affect the economy? And kind of, how it, uh, kind of basically how it all works together. Awesome. I'd like everybody to join me in thanking Brian for coming to Hudson today.